I was thinking back to uh, the latter years of my teenage years, and I lived in a place called Sun Valley, Idaho, and it was stunning. I lived in a valley with mountains on both sides. You talk about beautiful, gorgeous place, and I guess that's why so many Californians, they have a second or third or fourth or fifth home there. Folks like Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, Bruce Willis. I lived, I lived back in, let's see, 97, 98, 99. I lived in Sun Valley, Idaho. And Bruce Willis, of course, he was with uh, Demi Moore back then, and they owned half the town. They owned a, a, a place called Shorty's. It was a, an old-style uh, diner, and uh, I enjoyed eating over there. Uh, who else was there? Steve Miller. You guys remember the Steve Miller band? Um, in fact, we, I almost bought a, a window cleaning business. I was 18, 19 years old, and, and we were cleaning windows. And uh, it took us about a week to clean all the windows on Steve Miller's property because he didn't just have his house. He had three cottages in the back for when Paul McCartney would come in, and I'd be in the back drooling over the Les Pauls he had. You know, and then of course he had his his art studio in front of his house, and he, he's not good at art. But anyway, uh, he also had his music uh, studio, and I was I would drool when I'd go in there. There are twenty six hundred square foot studios in front of his house, so it took us about a week to do all the windows on their property. But I remember seeing Arnold Schwarzenegger up on on the mountain because I worked up on the mountain for a, a brief period of time, and it would we would have to take a, a lift. Uh, halfway up, so that probably took about 25 minutes, and then we'd have to take a cat that would ride up the mountain on the snow for an additional 20, 25 minutes. So it would take us a good while just to get up there. And I remember Arnold Schwarzenegger, he was in the place, and he had all his friends and family with him, and he was ordering all the food. And uh, my manager, she was a lady, and she was just, you know, following Arnold everywhere he went. And so, you know, these, get, these guys, I mean, Clint Eastwood was there. These guys, they, they all are recognized by people all over the earth. Now, I don't know them personally, so I don't know if they have a, a relationship with God, but, you know, I, I wonder how much these men and women are recognized by heaven. Because heaven has a different standard of recognizing people than, than people on the earth. Are, are you guys with me? In fact, the, the Bible says referring to Abraham, that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. What puts people on God's radar is faith. In fact, the Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, what is faith? We know that Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So I want to take a moment and just begin to define what faith is. Faith is a substance. It, it is a reality. It's a title deed. Are you guys alive? Faith. It was the invisible backing of the elders of our faith. Folks like Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, their wives, Moses. No, it was their invisible backing. Faith was the creative power of divine works such as the framing of the world. Faith is the divine testimony of doing what is right in the sight of God. In some cases, faith is the cancellation of natural laws. Like when Enoch was walking on the earth for 300 years and his life so pleased God that he avoided death. He just, he just disappeared. He broke that natural law of death. And just went to be with God. So faith is the cancellation of natural laws. We know that faith is the basis for pleasing God. Faith is dependence upon God's word. Faith is trust 
in an unknown future. Faith is counting things that be not as though they were. Faith is seeing the invisible. Faith is the assurance of God's faithfulness. It is a confidence in things to come. Faith is the lifeblood of the just. It is the shield of Christian armor. It is the down payment of things desired. And it's the guarantee of answered prayer. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. What things does the believer or the Christian hope for? We hope for salvation. We hope for righteousness. We hope for our calling in God. We hope for Christ in us, the hope of glory. We hope for greater New Testament glory. We hope for a future life. We hope for a resurrection from the dead. We hope for final rewards. We hope for final grace. We hope for coming, the coming of the Lord. We hope for being like Christ. And we hope for eternal life. Now the Bible says that by faith, we understand. By faith, we understand. So by faith, we understand God and his kingdom. Without faith, it is impossible to understand God and his kingdom. It's not with the mind that we come to understand God and his kingdom, but it's in the heart because that is where faith is born. In fact, the Bible says this in Romans chapter 10 and verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. You know, sometimes I get around other believers. Sometimes I get around other pastors. And they begin to kind of check me out to see where I'm at. You know what I mean? They, they begin that. are you one of these prosperity preachers? Well, the Bible says that God gives us prosperity. And they want to, well, how much of that do you believe? Everything that God said in his word, that I'll be blessed going in and blessed going out, that I'll be the head and not the tail, right? Well, are you one of these word of faith preachers? Well, if it was good enough, for the Apostle Paul to preach the word of faith, well, then I guess it's good enough for me to preach the word of faith. And then they'll say, well, are you one of these name it, claim it, blab it, grab it? Well, did Jesus say to his disciples, those who had laid down everything, they had become children of God, did he say that you can have whatever you say as long as you pray according to the will of God? Well, then I believe that. There's your box. I was talking to Chad yesterday, and he said, you know, sometimes people, they want to see what box you're in. What's your denomination? I'm a disciple of Christ. There's your box. So if it's good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. He says, the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in where? Your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now look at this. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So faith is born in our heart. That's why the Bible says to guard your heart. Watch what you're allowing into your heart. I constantly feed my heart on the word of God. If you want to walk in faith, you can't do it unless you're hearing and hearing and hearing by reading the word of God. As you're going to get out what you plug in. Amen. So faith is born in our heart. And then as we renew our minds to the word of God, to the preaching of the word of faith, then we'll begin to understand with this. 
but sometimes this can't go where this is going. And that's where you have to trust in the Lord, that he's leading you by faith. You know, Jesus said the words that you cannot even see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. It all begins in the heart. You know, saying that prayer, are you, your name is Alexis? I'm so glad you came today. It all begins in the heart. God moves into the heart and he begins to work from that place of your heart. That's where life flows. That's where faith comes. And so you cannot be born again unless you have faith. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through what? Through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So being born again is an act of faith. It is an act of faith. But you don't retire your faith when you become born again because it's a faith life it's a faith walk and everything that you do it must be done in faith so you say that sinner's prayer in faith you got to do it in faith otherwise it doesn't count when you give to the lord you have to give in everything that we do we have to do in faith whenever you pray In your understanding, you've got to pray in faith. That means that you believe that God is and that he's a rewarder of those who what? Diligently seek him. So when you you give and tithe an offering as an act of faith, you believe that God is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You're seeking him in that moment. You're connecting to his life. You're connecting to his world. And so everything that we do, when you come to church, come to church in faith. Come to church expecting God to do something, not just in you, but in other people. It's selfish to show up to church just for yourself. I come here excited about what God's going to do in somebody else. I come in faith, believing That somebody's going to get saved. Believing that miracles are going to happen. So you've got to come to church in faith. Whenever you shaka, brabaka, diedo, do diedo. you got to do that in faith. Amen. Everything we do. When we raise up our children in the admonition of the Lord, do it in faith. When you work, do it in faith. Everything that we do, we have to do in faith. Because that's what puts us on God's radar. That's what registers in heaven. So get out of tradition. Get out of religion. Get out of doing it just because mom and dad did it. Well, we've always done it this way. Yeah, but does it register on heaven's radar? Whatever you do, if you do it in faith, it registers on heaven's radar. Even the small stuff. How do I know that? Because I read the hall of faith. Those who made it in the hall of faith. What am I talking about? I'm talking about Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter. Those that made it into that chapter. I go back and I read what they did and I'm like, all right, well, they didn't lead a revival. They didn't start churches. Why was Abel put in the the great hall of faith? Because he brought an offering. He brought an offering in faith more excellent than his brother did. He brought it to God, and God said, man, I'm going to write that one down in the history books. He brought an offering. What about Noah? Why was Noah, his account written in the great hall of faith? Because he built a boat. Yeah, but Pastor Jeremy, it was an ark. I, I understand, but... When you think of it, was, it was a boat. He built a boat. That's what God told him to do. And he obeyed. 
And God said, I'm going to write this one down in the history books for generations and generations to come as a witness, as a sign, as evidence that I'm alive on the earth. What about Abraham? God spoke to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And he said, Abram, I want you to leave your house. I want you to leave this land, your family, and I want you to go to another location. So basically, Abraham got written in the hall of faith. His account was written in the hall of faith. Why? Because he moved. He obeyed God and he moved locations. Danielle and I, we know what it's like to move. How many times have we moved over the years? 18 times. She said that with like a little 18 times. She says she's not moving again. Unless God says. (laughs) How about Sarah? Why is Sarah written in the hall of faith? Because she had a baby. Yeah, but Jeremy, she had it at 90. I understand. But think about it. Her name was written down in that account because God said, you're going to have a baby. And she believed. Now, it didn't really sound like that when you go back and read the original account. But for whatever reason, God rewrote history and he said she believed. Go and read Hebrews chapter 11. And so her and Abe, with their bodies just as good as dead, they married each other again, and they had a baby. She was 90 years old. How about Moses' parents? Why, Why was their names written in there? Not really their names, but the account of what they did. Because they hid Moses for three months from Pharaoh. What about the Israelites when they, when they went to Jericho? God told them to march. Go and march. See, we often think, man, I've got to raise the dead in order to get rewards from God. Now, raise the dead. But God's looking at the little stuff. They went and they marched around that city seven days in a row. And those walls came tumbling down. Why was Isaac recorded in the great hall of faith? Because he looked at his two sons, Jacob and Esau, and the Bible says he blessed them. Do you know what that means? He spoke prophetically over his sons. How about Jacob? The Bible says that he laid hands on Joseph's two sons, and he worshiped God. God noted that little, seemingly little thing. For us to read today. We think, man, it's it's the big stuff. It's those that are behind the, those are the ones that receive the rewards. No, God's looking at it all. And whatever is done in faith shows up on God's radar. I think so often, you know, we we look, if I'm not the, the most vocal, well, then I'm not getting a reward. Right? But we are the body of Christ. And every part of the body of Christ is important. Not just the most visible parts. Today, you see my head. You see my hands are visible. And these are important parts. But every part of me, even the hidden stuff, it's all important. And it's the same in the kingdom of God. We are the body of Christ. You are important. What God has told you to do, what God has called you to do is so important. Are you with me? And listen, I love to study the great heroes of the faith. I talk about them all the time. I think about them all the time. But there are people with no names that heaven knows. There's a group of of businessmen that lived many years ago. And they went to a man named uh, William Graham Sr., who was a farmer. And they asked him, would you mind if we used your property, one of the buildings on your farm, to pray? We want to have an all-day prayer meeting. And he said, sure, go ahead. And on that day, there was a farmhand on the land, and he asked a young Billy Graham, what are these people doing here? And he said, I don't know, I guess dad's letting some fanatics use his facility. Years later, 
Billy Graham found out that those businessmen, who I don't know any of their names, they prayed on that day that God would raise up someone that would take the gospel to the ends of the world. From Charlotte, North Carolina. How awesome it was the farmer. It was his son. Wow. There's a gal you may have, you probably never heard of her. Her name was Susanna Wesley. She lived a few hundred years ago. And if you showed up by her house during the day and peered into her window, you probably thought she was crazy. But she would sit there, she'd put her apron over her head. And she would spend two hours with God every day, praying and reading the word of God. And listen, she had 10 kids. Now she had 19, lost nine of them. But she had 10 kids and a farm to run. And her husband was always away on ministry trips, ministry endeavors. He was writing books and stuff. So she had to raise all 10 of the children almost on her own and handle a farm. So don't tell me that you're busy. Don't tell me you don't have time for God. And every day she'd she'd put that apron over her head and she'd have her own tent meeting with God. She would encounter God in that little place. The kids knew not to mess with mama then. But that woman who did that every day, she vowed earlier in life that she would not spend more time in leisure entertainment than she did in the word of God and in prayer. And that woman, she raised up John and Charles Wesley. Now most people have never heard of her. They they heard of John and Charles Wesley. But I believe that the rewards of the fruit of their ministries will also be attributed to Susanna Wesley. We've all heard of Charles Finney. I love Charles Finney. I love to go back and read his writings. And there's a couple of folks out there that sort of remind me of of Charles Finney. I'll tell you a a story about Charles Finney. He was ministering at a certain location, and there was, as he was wrapping up the meeting, there was an aged man that came to visit him. And he said, Charles, I'd like to uh, invite you to come to our neighborhood. They They are unchurched. They've never stepped foot in a church, and I want you to come and preach the gospel to them. So Charles Finney makes his way out there. He was supposed to be there the next day at 5 o'clock, and as he's journeying there, it's hot, and he's miserable. He's stopping alongside the road, taking all kinds of breaks. By the time he got there, I mean, he didn't even want to be in the meeting. So he walks into the meeting. They're meeting at a schoolhouse, and he starts off with a hymn. And a lot of folks back then, they just, they knew the hymns of the day, the songs of the day. The church was the one that was coming out with all the songs. And so they began to sing with him. And, and as they sang, it was so, I mean, it was terrible. It was terrible. They couldn't sing. And finally, Charles Finney, he just puts his knees over his, his ears. And he shakes his head to sort of drown out all the noise of the singing. And when they finally stop singing, he falls on the floor in front of him and he cries out to God to fill him with power to preach the gospel to the people. Now, he didn't have a message ready. But all of a sudden, God gave him a scripture. It was Genesis chapter 19 and verse 14, which reads, Get up, depart from this place, for I will destroy this city. That was his scripture. Not very encouraging, right? So he begins to share the biblical history of Abraham and Lot and what happened in Sodom. If you you know the story, that's when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah for their sin. And so he, he begins to share this history. And all of a sudden, he began to look at the faces of the people and they began to just 
stare at him. And they looked so angry. Some of them, them had their fists clenched, and they were about ready to hit him. And, fi- and he's wondering, what, what's going on here? <laughs> so finally he says, you know, the gentleman that invited me here today says that none of you have been churched. So I'm, I'm here to preach the gospel today. And he said, so I took out the sword of the Spirit, and I just began to thrust it. He began to preach the gospel until all of a sudden he said the power of God went off like a powder keg. It just exploded. And people all over the church, all the bodies just hit the floor, and they were crying out for mercy from God. They're begging and pleading God for mercy. Save my soul, God. Charles Finney, he looks at the aged gentleman in the back that invited him there, and he yells at him. He says, can't you pray? The man falls down on his knees and offers a prayer. So Charles stoops down, and he begins to yell in this young man's ears that was on the floor crying out to God, and he preaches Christ to him. Finally, this young man, he gets it. He has faith, and he turns to the next person. And he begins to preach in their ear. Meanwhile, Charles Finney, he went and he continued to do the same thing until the sun had set. Now, mind you, the meeting started at 5. So there was no electricity a few hundred years ago. So 8 o'clock, I I gather, three hours, he does this. And finally, he had to close the meeting. He had to turn it over to the the, the man that invited him. So he leaves. He He had a meeting the next day. When he wraps up the meeting in this other location... They send word for him to come back to the meeting. So he comes back and he finds that they're all in the same exact position, crying out to God under heavy conviction of the Holy Spirit. They didn't even want to go home. So he finds out the second day that the people, they called this place Sodom because of the wickedness. And they called the man that invited him there, they called him Lot, Because he was the only believer there. And of course, the revival went on and and it just bore much fruit. And Charles Finney, he was one of those guys he would go into. He went to Rochester, New York. And he saw 100,000 people saved in his meetings in less than a year. Like the entire city came to Jesus. Entire city came to Jesus. But most people don't know of a man named Daniel Nash. They called him Father Nash. Now, Father Nash was sort of a a failed pastor. He was pastoring a church, and all of a sudden, revival broke out, and 70 people came to Jesus, and so the elders of the church, they got together, and they voted him out. We got to get this guy out of here. And they would invite him to come back and preach every once in a while, The the next time they invited him, another revival broke out and they had 200 people that got saved. But they still didn't take him on. So he felt like a failed pastor, right? And all of a sudden, he had this attack on his eyes. He had an eye disease that that left him. He, He had to go into dark places. He couldn't look at the light. He had to hang out in dark places. And during that time, he he was just so broken that he began to cry out to God and he began to pray. And it was in that season that he learned to pray. He became a man of prayer. And during that time, God began to heal him, both physically and spiritually. And he came out a giant, ready to pray. He became a man of intercessory prayer. Him and Charles Finney, they connected. And when Charles Finney would have a meeting in a city, Father Nash would go into that city and would pray, sometimes two and three and four weeks before Charles Finney would show up. And I'm not talking about just casual, bless him, Lord, bless him kind of prayers. This man, he said he was often frightened by some of his experiences in prayer, the kind of prayer where you groan in the spirit. And he would pray and fast for days and days and days. Even while the meetings were going on, Father Nash didn't come in the meetings. He would stay in a remote location praying 
often with two or three people. And when Father Nash passed away, Charles Finney said, I'm not doing the large meetings anymore. In fact, I'm just going to take up a pastorate at a church. But Father Nash, who most of us had never even heard of his name, I believe the credit, the reward, and the fruit of Charles Finney's ministry also goes to Father Nash. These seemingly small acts, if done in faith, will give you a reward in heaven. You know, and we don't often see the the totality of the fruit of the things that we do in life. Imagine being Abraham. Abraham, you're going to have children and offspring as numerable as the stars in the sky. And yet, what did he see? He saw Isaac. Maybe he saw Jacob the next generation. But he didn't see, not in the natural, the totality of all those offspring. And yet, he did his part. And so you may not see the totality of of all that you're doing for God and how that affects the kingdom of God. But just be faithful to do your part. Amen? Amen? The Bible says that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Their lives and the acts of faith that they demonstrated is a witness and has been a witness for thousands and thousands of years. What about your life? Are you leaving behind a witness, a testimony that says that God is real? He's alive. I'm telling you, a life lived in faith, it demonstrates the reality of a God who is invisible. I know some people, they get you know, a little tripped up over that especially overseas and in Asia, they make their gods and you can, you can see them. Of course, they're made of sticks and stones. My God, you can't even see them. I mean, wrap your brain around that. I can't even see them, but I can feel them. I know he's real because I'm looking at his footprint. Your lives lived in faith, is the footprint of the reality of God on the earth. Hallelujah. Praise God. What a life. What a life to live it by faith. God is faithful. Everything that you do in faith, he's a perfect accountant. He's probably much better than you, Mr. Kenneth. You're pretty good, but heaven takes a perfect accounting of all that we do. And we will be rewarded. There's going to be a moment when we're going to stand before God and he's going to divvy out the awards, the rewards. I want crowns to throw at his feet. I want want my life to, to just testify. The good God, I lived for God because He was so good to me. He was so faithful to me. That way, when I'm when I stand before Him and He He hands me those crowns, I want to be able to take them off and I want to say, "I did it all for you." Amen. 